It was six in the evening and the sun was on its way down. The prickling sensation of my skin let me know that it was still the beginning of spring. Here I stood outside this building with a big sign, Ladonis. As my hand grabbed the cold, vertical, twisting door handle, I began to notice the windows were completely blacked out. Ladonis. I knew this name all too well. It was my best friend from Boston had it tattooed on his shoulder. It was his stage name, Ladonis, meaning Greek god. I felt my face switch with a smile. The door began to open with the strength of my right arm. Heavy, I thought. I began my way through the door. The last of the sunlight had followed me through, and the door was completely shut. The darkness of the club began to sink sink in as my eyes adjusted. The smell of the place seeped into my nostrils as I walked further. Beer, mixed with a long-standing smoke that had clearly been allowed, still lingered. Immediately, I saw the bar to my right lit in red. The bottles on the shelves were basic brands, nothing too fancy. Then the light on the stage began to glow, a dull, glimmering white light, with lights that were flashing three colors from above, red, blue, and purple, undoubtedly with a reason. As I made my way to the bar, nervous to ask and scared I came this far to be let down, I told the bartender I'd like to apply for a job. The bartender responded with a knowing smirk. I was unprepared for what I was about to get myself into. The bartender, late 30s, attractive with sharp facial features, led me to a table next to the stage. Have a seat, he said, and I waited. Palms were sweaty and my mouth was dry. Within minutes of sitting in this half uncomfortable lumpy seat, an older gentleman with years of experience shone with wrinkles on his face. He must have been about 60, 65 to 70 with ice blue faded eyes. This man looked like he was going to be one of two things, a mob boss that pimps hoes and sells cocaine, or a very gram- grumpy grandfather type, or a combination of the two. I stood up and shook his hand, and he seemed intrigued with my greeting. You can call me Tommy. Have a seat. What's your name? Stunned by the question, nervous to respond, I blurted, Riley James. The name Riley James was the name of my Build-A-Bear teddy bear that I had when I was a kid. <laughs> I began to take on my teddy bear's name when I was 16 and started sleeping with a 46-year-old man for money. I took this name so it could never be traced and no one could follow me or tell my parents how I was making money. Tommy and I talked for a while. He asked where I had stripped before, and as I went over my go-go and pole dancing past, I told him about dancing at a place called Sticks in Maine, a shady gay club that had a mail review Monday where I got to dance and party underage. A dancer came on stage, and to my surprise, he was completely naked. Let's just say horses had nothing on him. (laughs) Then he started to do something with himself. I quickly looked at Tommy and said, I can't do that. He laughed and said, he's the only one that can. (laughs) I told Tommy about Boston and Cambridge, Massachusetts, about a place called Paradise that had funded a good portion of my memory suppressants. Nothing too serious, though. Just crack, coke, methamphetamine. I used these drugs to cover painful memories of my sexual abuse by my older brother at four, my mother completely not understanding my sexuality, and my father's brutal abuse. Don't get me wrong, though. My mother didn't know how to raise a gay son. My father was genuinely an awesome guy. It's just the seventh beer in, and being beat to make you stop crying kind of seemed counterintuitive. No one knew these things, so I buried them deep. As Tommy led me up the back stairs, my head was down, and I remember the blackish red carpet of the stairs turned into a small office. He had me sign documents that I can only assume were for tax purposes, where I wrote my name, Riley James, of course. No ID was taken, no background was checked. He asked if I could start at 9. I quickly said yes. 9 p.m. hit pretty quickly, but at this point, I had some whiskey courage by my side. 9.15 hit, and it was my turn to go on stage. That's when I ran into the fluffer, completely unknowing that this, what this guy's job was. He asked if I needed help before I went on stage, and in total innocence asked, what do you mean? He quickly dropped to his knees. Huh? I thought, this is your job? I walked on stage, glimmering in a dull white light. A blue light shone down over me, naked, hard, 
palms sweaty, and scared as hell. Then I grabbed on something I knew all too well, a pole. As I grabbed the pole, I started to hear the music that was already playing fade back into life. Britney Spears, piece of me. <laughs> Immediately, my confidence came back to life with a sinister smile. I danced like no other time before, with no interruptions. Then, my song came to an end. Um, I had realized that no men had hit me. I thought, well, where were they to put it? <laughs> I exited the stage. A dancer came up to me and explained how private rooms work. We charge 35 a song unless you think you can make more. I knew at this time what my innocent presence brought to the table, so I decided 50 a song. A man approached me. I had told him my raper song, and we made our, room, made our way to the private room. The rooms were more like booths, where the walls were red, with these bars for you to grab in order to put your junk directly in front of their face. No clothes on. And the closest protection was outside the booths at the t end of the tiny hall. I danced all night, and when I at the end of my shift, I tipped out the DJ 100, bouncer 150. I counted what was left, and realized for the entire night's work, I made $1,750. To say the least, I was stunned. As I counted my money, memories of my past began to seep in. My father, paying me to play football year after year when I hated it. And then one of them chasing me through the woods where I hid in a swamp because I didn't want to get beaten. The feeling of anger and rage burning through my chest. And then one of my mother, screaming at me to be more like my brother as we stood in the kitchen. A lump in my throat, tears beginning to build. And then, my older brother, the night when I was four and the sexual abuse began. Shame and fear stung through my core. I closed my eyes and held them tight. At that moment, a dancer grabbed my shoulder, ready for the after hours party. Without looking into his eyes, I scraped out a yes. A calming feeling of relief of the memories relaxed my entire body. The after hours party is where I met my best friend, Sam. Sam could only be described as the best friend a gay guy could ask for. No sexual tension, just a ride or die kind of friend. Yes, he of course knew the best drug dealers in town. And we got VIP bottle service in every club. Those are just the perks of being attractive, is what he used to say. Most of the time, I was usually sedated with whiskey or high on coke, or somewhere in between. We would go to the clubs, find guys that we liked, and took them to the apartment on East St. Catherine Street, where we shared a two-bedroom apartment. I should have known my drug habits would find me, and the pattern continue. I was called for work for the next eight weeks, where I learned my craft of manipulating men and women into what I want, getting what I wanted, money. I started to become what everyone thought I was, a pretty boy party boy with no limitations. I was down for whatever, drugs, drinking, sex. I even began having sex with clients in order to make more money. My morals were gone. I had become someone I wouldn't have recognized a year before. I wasn't doing drugs to hide or have sex to feel something. It was all different. Everything was similar where every action had its price. But I was looked upon as a party boy instead of someone who needed help. I became this person and traveled down this path so far. A ladies night came up. A night I normally did not work. I began my routine on stage, and once I was done, I was approached by a woman for a private dance. This woman was in her mid-40s, soccer mom hair, and you could tell from her face it was aged from years of alcohol abuse. As the private dance began, within seconds, I felt something wet around my junk. I pulled myself out of her mouth and said, no. She responded with, oh, are you gee? With the words flowing from her mouth in a heavy Canadian accent and the stench of cheap beer and whiskey that followed, she attempted it twice more with the same response. I left to get the bouncer when a young girl walked up to me. What did my mother do to you? It's my 18th birthday and I can tell she did something. Happy birthday? I awkwardly smiled. As I turned around, her mother handed me $600 and I walked away. I chalked this night up to another uncomfortable situation and chose to move forward. Then a night came up where everything seemed the same. Same fluffer, same DJ, same bartender. A man bought me a beer. Halfway through, I began to notice the taste was different. 
Maybe I didn't notice until I was almost finished because I had snorted a couple of lines of coke. As I saw a quarter left in it, I asked the bartender if, there was, if the beer had been skunked. He took the bottle and swigged it. His eyes grew wide and he grabbed my face and told me to run home now. He knew I lived close by and by the look in his hazel eyes, I remember I, had just, I believed I had just been drugged. I stumbled to the door and began to run. I made it two blocks down East St. Catherine where Sam had found me, just outside our apartment door. The next morning, Sam and I had a conversation about what had happened. He said I made it to the entryway where he found me. Nothing happened that I could recall, so I brushed it off. A couple months went by. It was now Halloween. I worked that night until 11 p.m. I went home to get ready for, for our night of fun, and God knows. I dressed in tiny white booty shorts with a bunny tail and ears, pure white of course, with glitter that would take years to remove from anything I landed on or touched. We bought an eight ball or two of cocaine and blew it within two hours. By this time, we were ready to go and have some fun. We headed towards parking, our favorite bar. We got VIP bottle service because there was no other way to do it. As we began to finish our stashes, we wandered to see what other trouble we could get in. Our dealer wouldn't go to the clubs, so I had Sam call him to meet us at the house. Parking was open till 6 a.m. We had plenty of time. I gave him the cash, we went home to pick up. As the three of us were there, I cut up nine lines for the start. I snorted one, burning occurred. I snorted two, more burning. This wasn't normal, but I figured it must be some good shit. The others did one as I did my third. The burn was unusual. Nothing like any other time. Sam looked at me and said, how do you feel? I looked at him and laughed and began to listen to music and started to dance. It was as if, my, as if my body was dancing and I had no choice. Then this freakish outer body experience where I was watching myself dance and have fun. Then the last part hit. That's the very moment Sam told me, you know that's a lot of K you just did. I turned to give him a look what do you mean, Kay? But it was too late. My gaily bunny self saw the world all of a sudden through two pinholes where everything was a hundred yards away. I was frozen. Couldn't move. Couldn't speak. Sam grabbed my shoulders and had the dealer pick up my legs. They carried me to Sam's bed. I laid there frozen with fear in a drug-induced coma. I knew I had asked for coke, but maybe something was miscommunicated. I heard the dealer leaving in the distance and my anxiety dropped just a touch. Sam came into the room. He turned me on my side. I assumed he did this just in case I got sick. I stared at the hard wood, delicate nightstand. I was too scared to sleep and too high on K to move or speak. I was paralyzed. Sam pushed my body over more. I felt something unexpected. I felt him in me. A pain in my body I did not ask for or give permission. A pain I could not stop or say no. I was paralyzed and could only see the cold wood of the nightstand. And when I finally realized all my life choices, all my decisions had gotten me to this point. The person I had called my best friend and my roommate had betrayed me. He took me as if I had no chance or choice. I was paralyzed. I remember the feeling of tears running down my face. He didn't notice or care, at least from not what I could see. I lay away all night, awake all night, terrified of what else could happen to my body while I could not move. 6 a.m. hit. I could finally hear myself whimper as I moved. Sam was passed out next to me. I looked at his face and studied the look he had. He was passed out like nothing went wrong and nothing bad could ever happen. That silent sleep where you have that innocent smile. I was filled with anger, rage, and absolute hatred. I thought about grabbing the nightstand and bashing it into his head until I could see nothing but bone and flesh mixed so well together until I got the satisfaction out of my system. I switched gears. Shame sunk in. I grabbed a towel and I showered. By the time I was done, I heard Sam stirring in the bedroom. I saw my keys in the bowl on the table. Fuck this life, and these people are not worth it. I took my keys. 
and my left my bunny ears and tail white as snow, <laughs> like the innocence I had lost. My pride scraped from the floor and chose to move on and carry on. My life needed change, and that was going to happen.